Hi guys, so um, I have done one of these before, but if you don't remember who I am, then uh, my name's Liam and I'm one of the zookeepers here at zoo to you So you'll have to bear with me today because I've got this little guy on my hands and he isn't very cooperative. So if the, the stream does take a little while to update, it's because I'm taking a while to press the button because this little guy isn't letting me press it, okay? So the homework for the week is that we want you guys to create basically your own 2D or 3D rainforest. So a 2D rainforest is just a drawing and the 3D rainforest is some kind of model. So uh, you can use anything you want um, to do that, just spare things that you have lying around the house. We've already had some really good um, entries of the rainforest, so hopefully you guys can keep them coming in. And remember that you don't have to you don't have to have started that at the beginning of the week. You can start that whenever you want um, throughout the week and then just add to it whenever you want as well. As long as we get the entries in by the end of the week, we'll be happy with that. The daily homework challenge is that we're looking for animals to add to the rainforest that live in the canopy layer. So yesterday we, uh, you guys had Stacy speaking about the emergent layer and you guys added some animals hopefully to your rainforest that live in the emergent layer. Now we're going to layer down and we're going to talk about the canopy layer. So um, you can add any of the animals that I speak about today. Um, ideally, Radama here will be added because he's the animal that we've got that we're going to focus on mostly. But I am going to talk about quite a few different animals. Um, so if you want to add them in, in instead, that's absolutely fine as well. So we're going to jump straight in and talk about the canopy layer. So the canopy layer pretty much just looks like this, if you guys can see the picture. There it is, popping up there. And it's basically um, a thicket of leaves all together. So on the forest floor, the trees grow up. They, um, they grow, up obviously, using the trunks. And then up at the top, all the leaves come together. So it, it uh, creates like a blanket of, of leaves. And that makes it really, really difficult for any predators that are looking um, to basically try and find food. Predators like this harpy, when the picture comes up, you'll be able to see, find it really, really, really hard um, to pinpoint where the prey is. And that's because the leaves, they all come together, like I say, like a blanket, and it makes it really, really difficult for any, any predators, such as a harpy eagle, to find out um, where the prey is. Because Redden is just on my back. <laughs> so in the canopy layer, the majority of animals that live there um, are monkeys. And that's because they've adapted, they've evolved over time um, to change and to be able to climb. So where are you going? So you can see Radham is a really, really good climber. Come back, there he is. Uh, so as I was saying, the majority of animals in there, uh, in the canopy layer, are monkeys. Um, and that's because they're really, really, really good climbers. So hopefully you guys can see um, the lion-tailed macaque that's flashing up on the screen. And these guys spend their whole lives living in the canopy layer of the rainforest. And that's because they don't need to come down for anything. So the forest floor um, and the, uh, the understory layers, they aren't, you know, they're, they're not very uh, good for the for the monkeys because there's more predators down there there's less fruits because there's more competition for food and um, they're in much more danger in the lower levels so what they do is when the babies when they're born because they're not very good climbers they cling onto the mother's uh, belly on the side and the, mo the mother climbs around with them um, them on the belly they might think this is quite dangerous but they've got a really really good grip as soon as they're born they're gripped on and then they don't let go for probably about four weeks, something like that. Um, and even then, they still don't leave the mothers. They, they um, just climb around on the mother. And they don't leave the mothers. But a few more weeks down the line, once they've finished drinking milk and everything like that, that's when they start letting go of the mothers. And they're actually really, really good climbers as soon as they, um, as soon as they let go. And that's because they need to be. So as I said, we're really, really high in the rainforest. We've got loads of different branches and leaves and stuff. If you're not a very good climber, it's a long fall down. So these guys need to make sure that they're uh, really good climbers from the start. 
The other picture that you guys can see is a picture of a Malabar squirrel. Now these are actually giant squirrels and these have got a really special relationship with the lion-tailed macaques. It's special for the macaques, not so special for the squirrels and I'll explain to you why. Now there's loads of these different um, relationships in the rainforests and um, we hardly get to see any of them because even if you were walking through the rainforest, you'd hardly get to see this relationship between these two. And that's because they're so high up. Now, these Malabar squirrels have got really, really, really good sense of smell. And the lion-tailed macaques know this. So even though they kind of form a little bit of competition between the species, um, the lion-tailed macaques put up with the squirrels because they need them, really. So every year, once a year, there's really, really big jackfruits that come. Um, and they grow really, really big at the top of the trees. Now, loads of people think that um, all animals have a better sense of smell than us, and that's not true. Lion-tailed macaques probably have about an equal uh, strength of sense of smell to what we have. So if we smell a fruit, we can't smell if that fruit's ripe or not. But the Malabar squirrels are really, really good at telling which fruits are ripe. So the lion-tailed macaques will hang back a little bit, and then they'll wait for um, the squirrel to find the ripest fruits. Then once the squirrel starts to try and eat it, the lion-tailed macaques then rush in and then scare it off the fruit. And they've got a really, really effective way of getting them off the fruit. It's very simple, but very effective. They literally slap them on the face. And it's, it's quite funny to watch. Um, it was actually on uh, a documentary uh, last weekend, if you guys get a chance to, to see it, called Primates. It's really, really good. They just slap them on the face and then they, the squirrels run off because they don't want to be slapped in the face. And then the macaques are left with the really, really tasty ripe fruit. And as I say, they haven't got any other competition other than from other monkeys because nobody else has, has got the ability to, to climb this high. And even the smaller ones like this little guy that do, um, they're, you know, they're not interested in eating the fruits. So the macaques get the fruits all to themselves then. And the Malabar squirrels basically have to wait to um, to eat after that. They've got to wait till the macaques are finished. So we're gonna move on from other parts of the world and focus on one single part of the world now. And we're gonna focus on Madagascar. So that's where this little guy's from. There's also loads of different um, species uh, that you don't find anywhere else in the world. So for example, lemurs, there's over a hundred species of lemur that live in Madagascar that aren't found anywhere else in the world and also fossas and temrex and things like that. So Madagascar is a really, really unique place, but it's in a lot of trouble. Now the deforestation is a really, really big um, issue for Madagascar. They've lost about 50% of the natural forests, which is habitat for all these, these guys. And the canopy layer is <clears throat> suffering the most, because as I said, these guys uh, who live in the canopy layer, they need all the coverage they can get to basically stay safe. And if the forest is being chopped down, all the trees are being separated and then there's hardly any coverage. If Radimer was just in one tree, it'd be really easy for any predators to see him. So um, the deforestation is really, really bad for um, the species that live in Madagascar. So as I said, lemurs live in Madagascar. Some species live in the canopy layer. You've got the blue-eyed black lemurs, which live in the canopy layer. But other species, such as the ringtails um, and shifakas, they live on the forest floor or in the understory. So <clears throat> some lemur species live in the, in the canopy layer. Other species that will go up into the canopy layer include birds, obviously. Um, snakes, some snakes will go really, really high as well. But we're going to focus on this little guy, Radama. And he loves to live in the canopy layer. And that's the exact same reason the monkeys like to live up there. There's less competition up in the canopy layer, and it's really, really difficult to see um, to see him basically when he's in the canopy layer. And of course, his natural colours help him to camouflage as well. So he's relatively small. Um, he's going to grow a little bit bigger than this. Um, he's a panther chameleon, so he will get a little bit bigger. But um, he's predominantly a prey species now. That, bit, that basically means he's going to get eaten if he's not careful, which is why he needs all these lovely colours to basically help him to camouflage. Now, loads of people think that they um, they change colour to camouflage, but that's not true. If that was the case, he'd be black now because he's in front of my jacket, and then he'd go a really light green colour when he's in front of my T-shirt, and then he'd try and go a skin colour when he's in front of my face. That's not, uh, that's not true. They basically change colour um, 
to signify what mood they're in. So say, for example, if they feel threatened or if they feel a bit scared, he's going to go a really, really dark black colour. So if I was to let him climb into the meerkats, I'm not going to let him do that, obviously. But if I was to let him do that, he'd go a really, really dark black colour, trying to threaten the meerkats and um, basically tell them to leave him alone. Try and look a little bit more scary. If he wanted to attract a female, um, he'd go a really, really bright red colour. So he's got some nice red colours on his face, um, but he can actually change most of his body um, a red colour as well. So if you look closely, I don't know if you can see on this camera, but he's got red all the way down his body. And this he can make this go really, really, really bright when he wants to attract a female. So he would do this in the wild and then the females would be really, really attracted to him. So as I said, he's predominantly prey, so he does get eaten quite a lot, but um, he is a predator as well. He's a predator of insects. We call this an insectivore. So he pretty much spends his time camouflaging in the leaves with his natural colours, and then an insect will come right close to him. And I don't know if you guys know, but chameleons can shoot the tongue out really, really far. So he'll shoot his tongue out, and it's really, really sticky on the end. And um, a fly or a grasshopper or an aphid, something like that, just a small insect um, will stick on there and then he'll eat them. And he'll spend his, his whole day doing this. So um, he needs to make sure he eats a lot of insects because they're really, really small and to get himself full and give himself energy as well. So they don't actually move around too much. Um, they don't necessarily have, uh, you know, like a territory, but they, do, they usually just tend to stay in, um, in the same area which they were born, really. Um, and that way... He knows that other chameleons are around there as well, and he doesn't have to risk um, being seen by any predators or anything like that if he stays um, in a close-knit area. He's also a reptile. Hopefully you guys all saw the, uh, the live stream I did a few weeks ago about reptiles, so you'll know he's cold-blooded, which means he can't warm himself up, which is lucky he's from Madagascar, which is nice and hot. Um, and also he's got scales. So even though he is really, really colourful, all of these scales... Um, mean that he's a reptile. So these little sharp bits on his back here, they're scales, and all of these um, scales all over his body as well. They're relatively easy to see on his head. Don't know if you can see that. It's quite hard, but there is scales there. Um, the other thing I can tell you is that he's a really, really strange looking animal. Now, he's very nice with all these colours and stuff, but no, there's no other animal like him really in terms of um, the features that he has. So his feet look a little bit like this. So they grip on like this really, really, um, really, really tightly. And that means he's an expert climber, which as I've mentioned, you need to be when you live in the canopy layer of the rainforest. Another thing he's got is his eyes bulge out of his head a little bit. So um, his head is just straight like this and then his eyes come out to the side. And these eyes, they can go 360 degrees. So he can look backwards, he can look forwards, he can look forwards with one eye, backwards with the other. Um, and that's basically, number one, to keep an eye out for predators, but mainly um, so insects don't see him when, um, when he's hunting, basically. So if he stays nice and still and there's only his eyes moving around, the insects will, uh, will find it really difficult to see him. But if he had to turn his head all the way, if he had to turn his, his head to see them, the insects would then see him and then they'd, jump off, uh, they'd, they'd run away from him or fly away. Um, so he needs to make sure he can uh, move his eyes individually and that way um, the insects won't be able to see him. So uh, the last thing I'll tell you is that these guys love it nice and uh, nice and moist, nice and damp, nice and humid. And that's because um, they need to be able to shed the skin, just like all other reptiles. And they just love the, the humidity. So if anybody ever has these as pets, I'm sure a few people do. Um, you need to make sure you're spraying them all the time. Um, and that basically just simulates a, a natural environment because he is from the rainforest, which gets a lot of rain, hence the name rainforest. Um, so it needs to be nice and warm and nice and humid. Now, I don't want to advocate getting these as pets um, straight away because these guys are uh, really, really quite difficult to look after. Um, there's a lot of maintenance. You need to make sure you know what you're doing. So if you're interested in getting a reptile, that's great. Excellent. Get something like a bearded dragon first to start you off. And then when you're really comfortable, um, do your research about these guys because uh, they are really loving pets, as you can see. 
um, and then uh, feel free to get one after that. But you need to make sure you know what you're doing, otherwise um, they will suffer. They will really struggle. So um, you need to make sure you know what you're doing with these guys. So that's pretty much Radimer in a nutshell. What we're going to do now is we're going to move on to some of the homeworks that you guys have sent in. So we have had quite a few entries and we've picked out um, some of the best ones. So come on, stop up. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of them. So when they eventually pop up, here we go. So this one here is um, one of the Ecolectus parrots that we saw yesterday. And there's the whole scene. So you've got the Ecolectus parrot, the harp eagle, which I've also spoken about today. So they can live in both the canopy and the emergent layers. Um, and that's from the Carroll family. So thank you so much for that. This one here is from the Pender family. And this is Trevor the parrot, who's really enjoying this, this uh, 3D rainforest. And this one is from the Tennant family. So we've got some really, really cool um, inventive rainforests going on. And hopefully you guys will be able to um, <clears throat> add some animals in from the canopy layer. Like I say, feel free to add a chameleon. But you can also add a lemur, um, a monkey, a squirrel, um, or even a harpy eagle if um, you want to add um, a harpy eagle to uh, the canopy later as well. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go through a quick recap. So we've looked at the canopy layer of the rainforest. Can you remember what features it has? So think about all the different leaves, the trees that bind together. Um, and basically the fact that it's a, a big blanket of leaves and it's really, really difficult for anything underneath or above the canopy layer to see anything inside the canopy layer. We also met Radimer. Can you remember some of his features? Maybe incorporate that into your design when you design a little chameleon, if you want to design a chameleon. Remember the eyes that poke out of the face, remember the little feet, um, and also all these different colours, of course, as well. So your homework for today is to make sure you add some of these animals to your canopy layer. Of course, if you're late joining us, then feel free to, um, you know, catch up. Like I say, there's no time limit on uh, you guys joining in. If you send your rainforests in today, we can always include them on, on next week's as well, uh, on tomorrow, sorry. And we'll, um, we'll show off some more of the homeworks tomorrow. So we just want to give a special thanks um, and a big shout out to Ewan and also Freddie and Millie who have all um, contributed to our fundraiser. They're all enjoying our live sessions, which is really, really good. Um, and I'm sure you guys know about the fundraiser. Um, we've mentioned it quite a few times, but if you're not aware, there's the link on the screen now. Um, anything you guys can do to help us um, would be really, really appreciated. And that's pretty much just because all of our money, as you guys probably know, if you know us as a company, comes from outreach. And with the COVID-19 um, crisis going on, we can't do anything. Um, <clears throat> we can't do any outreach. We can't go to schools or anything like that. So we're missing out on a lot of money. So any, any help at all um, is greatly appreciated. Um, also, if you want to send over PayPal, the link's on there as well, um, rather than uh, you know doing it over the fundraiser. So uh, that's it from me. Uh, I'll be back on Friday talking about the, uh, the forest floor. And tomorrow you guys have got Stacey and she's going to be talking about the understory.